You're listening to The Real Short Box, a comic book podcast made for geeks by geeks. Hello out there in podcast land. Welcome to the righteous pod known as The Real Short Box. My name is Dr. Kevin, the doctor of pop culture. And to my right is the laird of the land of pop culture. He calls himself Donald. He calls himself Donald <laughs> <laughs> for some reason. Hi, I got nothing fancy. And to his right, he is the one, the only, the Buckeye State King, the man of the hour. He calls himself Darren. And guys, did you get your ballots in the mail? Apparently, there's a vote for president of Podcast Land. You don't say. How many people does Podcast Land consist of? I would Um, say at least 100 million people. According to Instagram, yeah, quite a bit. Quite a bit in Podcast Land. And hopefully listening right now out there in Podcast Land. Huh? Huh? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, and I, I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard for me. I, I'm thinking of, quite honestly, voting Pillsbury Doughboy as the president of Podcast Land, because <laughs> why not? <laughs> right? <laughs> you poke that little guy and he, oh my god. Oh, what, what was that, fans? You want us to do another round? Woohoo! <laughs> 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 All right, then. Uh, Kevin, why don't you go ahead and let everyone know what we're up to today? Today, we decided to follow up with our Fun Facts Marvel pod with a DC Comics Fun Facts pod. Mm. Oh, oh, DC Comics, not Washington, D.C. Fun Facts. Exactly. You can actually make this mistake in Google. Shoot, I'm going to have to redo mine, guys. What? Yeah. I got Abe Lincoln's beard wasn't real, and that was his wife. Oh. The Mm. National Aeronautics and Space Museum. I mean, God, there's so many things we could have discussed. National Treasure just spoiled a lot of real facts for me. There's two declarations of independence, you don't say. Yeah, man. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) There's there's some massive fading going on. So, Kevin, what what do you think? Should we just get right to it, or is there some other absolutely useless fact that everyone needs to know listening to our podcast? They should just know that we're a very cool pod. Hmm. Like mm. temperature wise? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's throw out one real quick. What was the original name of DC Comics before it was DC, Com- DC Comics? It was known as National Periodical Publications, started in 1935 by Colonel Wheeler. Boy, isn't that boring? Yeah, it's boring. Well, what and, if you know, it, didn't DC Comics originally stand for Detective Comics? That's correct. Yeah. But, but what, if, what if that answer came from Serial Guy? Serial Guy? Pop Tart Lad. Serial guy, you know, serial guy talking about the old days. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. From the 1940s, he was talking about this. Kind of like the Keebler Elf, see? Talking about Detective Comics. I don't think the Keebler Elf said, see? (laughs) Try my cookies, see? (laughs) I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. How old is the Keebler Elf? Maybe he's running for president of podcast. Old enough, yeah, definitely. He could do it. All Mm -hmm. right, Kevin, you have the random generator. Granny Sweetwater is on deck to hand you the balls from the machine. Here we go. Number 12. How about this? Did you know that in among characters in the Green Lantern universe, the original Green Lantern, Alan Scott, and the uh, villain that would be connected to Hal Jordan, that Green Lantern, that Sinestro, and Alan Scott were both left-handed. Wow, Donald, on a scale of 1 to 10, how interesting was that fact? 12. Is the number 12. That's why it's number 12. (laughs) I'm going to say 11 because it's an odd number much like left-handers are odd weirdos yes we are and that's why i pass on number 11 to donald oh i'll take it i've got a good one for you this one's a little better i think let's see um so bob kane's original design for batman was a little different than what we uh what we see now it might have faded actually into obscurity if he'd gotten his way kane drew batman as a blonde man with red friggin tights uh, black little, uh, what you would call tidy whities so to speak, uh, and a domino mask. The winged cape was present, but against the, uh, red suit and domino mask, the cape seemed out of place and strange in a very bad way. Uh, nothing memorable about it, really, except for the fact that it is, uh, really odd. And, uh, 
I don't know. Strangely alluring. But Batman was a blonde. That's very interesting. Like kind of that Nordic look. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's mine. All right. Who do we got next? Granny Sweetwater. Let's get on it. Number 10. Did you guys know that Superman originally started as a bald villain? What? In 1933, Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel, when they originally conceived uh, Superman, it was a title called The Reign of the Superman. He was a bald-headed villain that was bent on world domination with the power to control people's minds. Superman is actually kind of a villain to this day, often in covers of Superman comics. I do a little collecting on what I would call as uh, Super Dickery. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I've seen those books. Covers in which Superman's kind of an asshole. I mean, look at that. Yeah, that looks right. And that looks like the reign of Superman. So, so, so Donald, what, what exactly happens when there's a, an issue with water in Metropolis? <laughs> I'll explain that. By the way, that comic cover, The Reign of Superman, that actually looks like Lex Luthor. It does. So you know so that basically, is the inspiration. Yeah, they just did that. So basically, Superman became Lex Luthor. If you my, think about my, it, that's mind-blowing. Mind is controlling people's minds would actually go to another bald-headed character at another comic book company. That's true. That would be Xavier. Yes. But, but Reign of Superman, he actually looks a lot like the Smallville version of the Lex Luthor villain. Uh, oh, yes. the Michael Rosenbaum. Michael Rosenbaum. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, But yeah, Superman, uh, he oftentimes withholds water from people in Superman <laughs> comics. Wouldn't give any water to uh, Jimmy Olsen or Aquaman <laughs> and uh, half the citizens of Metropolis. He was smiling point, while he was doing it, too. Yeah, he's a kind of a smirk. Yeah, kind of an asshole. Oh, what's asshole. that catchphrase? Not a drop. Not a drop. <laughs> yep, not a drop. And not dropping off, number nine. Number nine. Well, I wouldn't uh, be where I am today without number nine. Actually, I don't I don't know what that even means. Um, so basically, in Superman, uh, his girlfriend, Lois Lane, this was a comic book that came out. It was out for a long time, actually. Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane. Uh, Lois Lane, in issue number 106, turned herself into a black woman. And lived her life for 24 hours as a black woman. Um, this came out in 1970. Artist uh, at the time for the cover was Kurt Swan and uh, Murphy Anderson. It depicts uh, the white Lois Lane stepping into Superman's plastic old machine and stepping out as a black woman. Uh, basically, uh, it, it told about uh, her. She explored race relations in Metropolis as uh, she transformed into a woman to write a story about Little Africa. Um, and she was questioning why, once she turned back into a white woman, people from Little Africa treated her differently. And that is a question that we often ask to this day. So it's a very powerful, monumental issue that I recommend if anybody can get their, their grubby little hands on. Because it's basically a story do. about what it's, what it's like to wear the other shoe, but, essentially. Yes, absolutely. But also, too, like let's keep in mind the historical context here. Segregation was very fresh in the minds of Americans, especially African Americans. Mm -hmm. So this Correct. book, of course, uh, will have a very accurate depiction of that because mm -hmm. it was just so fresh in everybody's mind. Like, I mean, for the most part... Only older generations would be more or less familiar with actual real segregation today. But right. that, I was like, everyone knew about it. It's good to have a reminder. And this, uh, you know, in this issue, she realized the struggle of everyday life as a minority, which is important to this day, let me tell you. Couldn't be more important to this day. But speaking of this issue, I happened to actually pick it up Superman's Girlfriend Lois Lane, number 106, at our favorite comic shop, Spiro's Heroes. Wow. Just got it over the uh, the last couple weeks here um, on the cover. It says, I am Curious Black, uh, plus another explosive adventure of Rose and Thorn. And uh, this was a steal of a deal, guys. And let me tell you, Elliot, uh, the proprietor of Sparrow's Hair, is the godfather of comics, really hooked me up with uh, a great deal on this comic book and a host of others over the weekend. I just loaded up on books. And I'm that you guys saw the stack over here. It's amazing the books I got and the prices I got. So definitely, please go into Sparrow's Heroes uh, up in uh, the Chatsworth Canoga Park area if you can. Uh, Elliot will always give you a steal of a deal. And tell him that the real short box sent you. Yes, and honestly, even though we are doing a DC podcast, I absolutely love the Malibu comics that you were able to collect recently. Yes, 
yeah, Malibu Comics, who at, uh, you know, not too long ago, outsold uh, DC comic books uh, in sales. They became the number two in the market share uh, in the 90s. Wow. Unbelievable. Insane but true. Unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, that's my number. Uh, who is next? Okay, well, I uh, let's there, here he is. Number eight. Stan Lee did some work at DC. Who? And essentially what he did was he did a little reimagining of the three main Trinity characters of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Batman was not Bruce Wayne. He was known as Wayne Williams, an African-American. Superman went by Saul Dean. And Wonder Woman was known as Maria Mendoza. Unfortunately, for what I'm told, that it just didn't really work too well. But no. the betrayal. You don't hear about too many people talking about it, to be honest. And yeah, you're right. I mean, it did, like, Marvel people were like, dude, what the fuck? You know, like... As they should. Why Why is he doing this? But if you're Stan Lee, who's a guy that at one point felt pushed out and denied by Marvel Comics, uh, you, you, why not? You know, why not? If they're willing to give you a stab at it, why not just uh, take a crack and see how you do? He's living the story of his own character, Norman Osborn, getting pushed out of his own company. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, the, the irony is just so thick, so rich. Mm-hmm. It's just about as rich as the color in that sweater that our businessman is wearing right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot. This is your This is your full-time job. Yes. Podcast. What's our next one? What's our next one? Number seven. Oh, number seven. That's me. Ooh la la. I want to talk. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Captain Marvel, Miss Marvel Shazam uh, snafu that basically happened. A lot of confusion. Yes, yes, yes. So if you say that I love that Captain Marvel movie, oftentimes people will be like, Carol Danvers. Oh, yay, the Marvel movie. No, 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 no. <laughs> when I say I love that Captain Marvel movie, I mean I love that Shazam movie. The original. The original Captain Marvel. It came out in the late 30s, early 40s, if I recall. Yes, yes. yes. Um, Captain Marvel, basically what happened was um, the show, uh, well, not the show, but... Uh, DC uh, licensed the Fawcett characters in 1972. They had the Fawcett character named Captain Marvel, but couldn't call the comic Captain Marvel because they let the rights to the name lapse. And in doing so, gave Marvel Comics the option to purchase the rights for the name of that character and trademark that to where DC Comics can no longer call their Captain Marvel character Captain Marvel and... The covers of their own damn comic books. How crazy is that? That is nuts to me. I, I get it. While Marvel Comics did it, they did it for two reasons. They're Marvel Comics. Why not have a Captain Marvel? It makes sense. And why not screw DC Comics, your number one competitor in the process? I mean, that was a one-two punch. I bet in in the annals of, of F-U-over type things... This has got to be up there near number one. Oh, in the boardrooms, there must have been laughing their asses. Oh, my God. They were cracking up. Yeah. So basically, after that, all they've done in the Captain Marvel world of DC Comics is the Trials of Shazam or Shazam Comics or just Shazam. And I believe now at this point, they've officially just renamed Captain Marvel Shazam mm -hmm. because they're done arguing with it. They're like, we're over this. Well, Whistling Willie told you. He told you, do not mock title lawyers. Title lawyers are very important, folks. Mm -hmm. Don't mess with the power of the, of the legal team. Nope. It's no joke. Number six. We are halfway into number six, and finally, the man with all the talent gets to speak. There you go, buddy. Joker was actually an ambassador from Iran to the United Nations. <laughs> what are you talking about? You see, now this is where we have comics cross into the real world. So, in the uh, series known as A Death in the Family... Ayatollah Khomeini himself appointed Joker to be the Iranian ambassador to the United Nations. I didn't know that the Joker was a Persian uh, heritage. He's absolutely not of Persian heritage. He is clearly in white clown paint, sir. Wow. You've never seen a baby come out of the womb in white clown paint? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. I believe it was my sister. <laughs> wow. 
ask me. <laughs> Kevin, bro, you got to open your mind, bro. Okay. All right. So Batman could actually not pursue Joker <laughs> because of diplomatic immunity. Lethal weapon to anybody. Wow. Wow. By the way, this year's the 30th anniversary of Lethal Weapon 2. Mm -hmm. Diplomatic immunity, says Joss Ackland. All right. Joker also said he and the Iranians were, quote, treated with disrespect by the rest of the world. Gee, has every dictator in the history of, say, the world said that at one point? Absolutely. Yes. You've got to say you're looking out for the people even when you're not. <laughs> Number five. N moi? Yes. Moi. All right. Here we go. This is outstanding. Wonder Woman used to be named Suprema. What are they trying to say? What? 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 Okay, so in the 1940s, the infamous psychologist, Dr. William Moulton Marston, the inventor of the lie detector and man most responsible for the never-ending run of the Maury Povich show. Kevin? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you are the father. No, I am not. So if you're not the father, you, of course, will be doing the worm and some other obnoxious dance then. That's point. true. I probably would be. Okay. Now, he wrote an article about the negative effects of comic books on children. And Charlie Gaines, who's the publisher of Superman at the time, was so impressed by his theories, he hired him as a consulting psychologist, which is kind of interesting because he wasn't consulting Charlie Gaines. He was consulting the company of DC. That's kind of fascinating. Uh, Marston suggested the best way to counter these negative effects was actually to create a female superhero. But the um, research was not, let's say, well-founded or well-defended, so Gaines was generally unconvinced. But Marston instead, he's like, I'm an employee of DC. In February of 1941, he wrote a draft of Suprema, the Wonder Woman. Editor of Superman at that time, Sheldon Mayer, uh, took up the project. He dropped the Suprema because it was just too close to Superman, which, of course, at the time was their most popular character, maybe next to Batman. Mm -hmm. All right, that's that's what I got there for number five, guys. And number four. Oh, well, the man can't take a breath. Wonder Woman and Green Lantern were actually supposed to date. What? I mean, she is a... Gorgeous woman of great presence. She has got to want to date somebody, right? Sure. I mean, everybody wants to date somebody in comic books, I uh, guess. Okay, so this idea, and honestly, it didn't get much past the actual um, idea phase. Okay, so in the 1970s, this idea uh, was scrapped, strangely enough, because a fan had wrote in and suggested the exact same idea. And just like our boy Whistlin' Willie said earlier, title law matters, people. Because due to legal reasons, DC could not actually push through this storyline without a tremendous fight. Hmm. Uh, little things that are, you got the devil's in the details, folks. But with this thought, I mean, I got to throw it out there. Could the reason that Hal Jordan, like, destroyed the Green Lantern Corps be because he didn't have a woman? I mean, maybe he's just angry. <laughs> Just saying. Possibly. You know, Blake Lively's just not going to do it for us, guys. Just saying. Makes sense to me. All right. We're moving on to number three, yes? Yes, we are. I, m m m me again? <laughs> is, it, is it you again? It, it is me again. It's going to be Louise. quite outstanding. Here we go. All right. I am sorry to ruin the dreams of all of you hardcore DC fans, but Adam West was indeed not the first person to play Batman in a movie. He wasn't? Yes, he wasn't. See, I tried to respond the best that I could to you, but clearly my timing needs work. Groundlings, everybody. Go to the groundlings. Okay. In 1964, genuine nut job Andy Warhol, that's my opinion, Andy Warhol featured Batman in a film called Batman Dracula. Wow. Okay, guys, have you ever seen an Andy Warhol film? No, I haven't, actually. Okay, so nope. some gross, bizarre stuff. Okay, uh, Udo Kier, the man who speaks like this Look, all the time. He was avant-garde. Okay, no, it's, it's kind of avant-garde, but it's also... He really liked the Frankenstein and Dracula. There are some bizarre things in this thing. There was, Igor was playing a character in the Dracula film, and I kid you not, 
He walks in with a sponge of blood to Dracula, and he's like, Well, you see, Master, uh, there was a car accident outside, and I thought, what a great opportunity. So I take sponge, and I go in, and I just take sponge <laughs> off of thing, and I give to you, Master. And then? There was another thing that's so gross. Do you actually want me to describe it on this podcast? Because no, I no, will. no. Pass. Okay. Okay, we got to keep it PG-13. All right. So these films are hysterical, loaded with blood, nudity, absurdity. Uh, and, but, and, and, and what the DC Comics allowed them to get away with it? No, no, no. That's the thing. DC, of course, didn't approve this. So actually this film that was being made, which, by the way, starred underground cinema director Jack Smith. He was playing Batman. And they filmed it on various rooftops in New York, the beaches of Long Island. Uh, so because DC didn't give him permission to do this, he really only screened it at a couple of his art shows. Um, mm. which, what's kind of interesting about this for anyone who actually cares to see this film, only 40% of it actually remains intact. It mm. was uh, not uh-huh. well taken care of. It was obliterated. But there was a documentary, I see roughly about 2006, about Jack Smith. Uh, and they actually were able to recapture the old footage. So you could see kind of what it was. And yes, it was Goofy and Warhol. And so so the remaining goofy. footage or just that 40% footage? The 40% of the footage. Is- I, I have a feeling the rest of it's out there somewhere. It's going to be in someone's garage in or, or attic. soup can somewhere. You know what's funny? <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. But, what? But as you guys know, film needs to be taken care of it very well. You could lose tons of film. Ted Turner became a hero to so many people while simultaneously being a villain, but a hero at the same time from restoring and saving all these movies. Mm-hmm. He preserved the history. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and we- speaking of history, number two, oh, I've got I, a- I believe it was very historic. Yeah, I've got a good piece of history for you. Alan Moore, we all remember him? Yes, we do. Mm-hmm. He, has, he has a cool beard. He worshipped a snake god. I think he still does up to this point. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. He's yeah. a very interesting fellow. Snake god worshipping man whose wife left him for another woman that also worshipped a snake god. Interesting. Yeah. You know, just a few years ago, there were another snake called, uh, just like in Conan the Barbarian. It always is that way. They always come back around. Cobra! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, yeah, so Alan Moore wrote this series called The Watchmen. I'm sure we all know about it. Uh, HBO is, uh, you know, they got a series coming out here um, very, 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 very soon now. It's out now. It's very soon. Um, they, they've got a uh, Watchmen series. Uh, basically takes place after the, the Watchmen uh, comic books, which Alan Moore wrote for DC Comics. Is Richard Nixon still the president? He is actually yes, yes in the okay. in the Watchmen uh, comics. I don't know if he is in the in the series or not, um, but he is in the comic books. Richard Nixon was a played a big part actually, um, but he wanted to use the old Charlton comics, Charlton comic characters to create his universe. But uh, he wanted to use them because DC recently uh, acquired the rights to all of the characters. They purchased every single one of them, and he wanted to kill a few of them off. And DC was like. Uh, I don't know. We just introduced them into our universe. We might want to use them. We're going to pass. And so he was like, okay, uh, Dick Munchers, what if I just uh, make up my characters? And they're like, yeah, okay, that's fine, yeah. But what they didn't think about was he's making up characters basically the, the same as them, so basically parallel. For example, instead of Punch and Julie, which were two villains in the Charleston uh, universe, you had Mime and Marionette hmm. in the Watchmen DC universe. That works. Instead of um, Night Owl, the second one um, you had, which was Dan Dryberg, you had Ted Cord, a.k.a. the Blue Beetle. So you had him instead. Wait, wait, <laughs> you know, wait, wait. wait. Isn't, you mean reverse. You mean yeah. reverse. Isn't Jaime Reyes the Blue Beetle? Um, no. You shouldn't Get say out. That. You shouldn't say that. Sir. Get out! You shouldn't say that. Get out! Um, yeah, so instead of Ted Cord, uh, Blue Beetle, you had the Night Owl, which is Dan Dryberg uh, in the Watchmen universe. Uh, same thing that happened with uh, the uh, original Blue Beetle. Instead of uh, Dan Garrett, you had Night Owl the First, which was Hollis Mason, who, if I recall, in the comic, wrote a book about the, the Watchmen characters, uh, the Minutemen, so to speak. 
Um, instead of Nightshade, in uh, who uh, appeared in a, I believe it was a Captain Adam comic book, her first appearance, you had the Silk Spectre. And instead of Thunderbolt, you had Ozymandias. Ooh. Yeah, which was a cool one. And instead of the question, which I love this one, this is my favorite. Instead of the question, you had Rorschach. Right. Which is perfect. And, of course, Captain Adam himself. Right. Captain Adam himself would be... Um, Dr. Manhattan. Dr. Manhattan. And the peacemaker was the comedian. Hmm. Which was a great uh, great idea for Alan Moore. He was able to create these characters. And these characters actually endured. And uh, eventually, the, uh, the new Watchmen series that uh, Jeff Johns is doing, uh, probably by the time this podcast airs, and then add four years to that, he'll have finished... His uh, Watchmen, uh, bringing the Watchmen into the DC Universe story that he's been trying to do for so damn long now. So that's my number, what was it, two? Number two. Yeah, so who's number one? Who's got number one? And now for number one, something that I even I was not aware of. DC was nearly bought by Marvel. What? Uh-oh. That's insane. Lies. In, in 1984... Warner Brothers, which owned DC Comics and still owns DC Comics, didn't didn't think it was worth keeping around. Wait, do they own them or are they partnered with them? No, they own them. No, they own oh, them. they own them. Okay. Yeah, 1984, there was a point in time where Warner Brothers just wanted to dump them because it wasn't really making money and they offered it to Marvel because they felt, well, Marvel's management was better. They're selling better. So let's, let's give them, you know, the DC characters. Well, Marvel, in their arrogance, said no. They felt that the the reason why I was failing wasn't because of management. They just felt that the characters sucked. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Yeah. So they chose not to turn down the offer. Now, of course, ironically, a decade later, Marvel was the one who was in, who was in trouble when they went bankrupt. Yeah. <laughs> so it goes to show you, when there's an opportunity, you better take it. Mm-hmm. Opportunity knocks. You come and you you answer. I guess. So, sure. so, however, we should be happy that it didn't happen because, you know, it may be too much. Because you think about it, if they were owned by Marvel, you think they would treat them with respect? No. no. I mean, I'm also kind of the opinion, too. Like, I mean, if you were destined to go bankrupt in roughly 10 years, how much could that have been accelerated if you had the DC property as well? Because if you can't manage your own property, how can you manage another? That's true. Yeah. So they might have both went belly up and we would just have Dell and. <laughs> And Gold Key? And think about it. We wouldn't even have Image Comics. No. We, we very well could have many Dick Tracy sequels at this think point. Think about it. No Walking Dead. Holy crap. Could you imagine how, how critical that year 1984 was? Mm-hmm. My this, goodness. This is exactly why we are all members of a petting zoo being watched by an alien race. It's true. From the fourth dimension? <laughs> I don't why know not? Fourth dimension. Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, anyway, that's it, right? That's, that's our list. That's, that's our, our top our uh, top 12. And don't worry, in the future, we're going to do more fun facts list. Maybe, if you like it. They'll like it. Like fun facts about your biceps? Yeah, but let us know. Give us a watch. Give us a listen. Give us a wink and a nod. YouTube, iTunes, Spotify. Mm-hmm. Google Play Music. Um, uh, whatever, a Sprecher. We're Sprecher. on that as well. Yes. Yeah, so. We were exploring MySpace. And then we stopped. Yes. <laughs> like Justin Timberlake else. wouldn't give us a deal. Tom called us and said to stop. Tom. <laughs> He's like, you can't do it anymore. And we're like, okay, Tom. But uh, with that, uh, my name is Donald. My name is Kevin. And I'm Darren. And uh, maybe if you're out and about, we'll see you at the wonderful, glowing, and happy comic shop. shop. This has been The Real Short Box. We'll see you at the comic shop. Thanks for listening. 